Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Commissioner of Agriculture and the Senate Agriculture Chair talk about proposals to help the many farmers and livestock producers impacted by the summer drought. Plus, lawmakers form a Reproductive Freedom Caucus. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Agriculture is a foundational part of Minnesota's economy, and Minnesota's farmers are adept at persevering through all kinds of challenges. Lately, the difficulties have mounted, stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and, in some areas of the state, a brutal season of drought. Joining me to talk about the governor's farm relief proposal is the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Tom Peterson. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here. You have traveled around the state and talked with lots of people in the agriculture industry. How has this summer's drought impacted them and what have you been hearing from both farmers and livestock producers? Yeah, you know, it's just been what a crazy summer, you know, as we look at everything. You said it well, as it hasn't been just the drought, it's been, you know, COVID. I think 2019 was the wettest year on record for farmers. 2018, we had a record low income, you know, so it's just been one thing after another. And then we went into 2021 thinking things would be better, and we ended up with this drought. And the drought is not only that we have a lack of water, but the excessive heat that we've had this summer, you know, just burned uh, crops up. And so we really made an effort myself. I've traveled to all uh, corners of the state. Literally, I've been uh, on many farms this summer. I had the governor out on many farms so we could hear firsthand. I also, uh, starting three months ago, hosted uh, drought stakeholder calls every three months, every, th every two weeks for the last three months to really hear from our stakeholders and update people what's going on so that we could put this drought package together. Because, you know, we, um, at one point, 80% of Minnesota was in a D2 or severe drought, and almost 50% of Minnesota was in an extreme drought. Uh, 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 35 percent so a lot are you know of Minnesota and we're still in that in northern Minnesota so it's a really tough position and we're really concerned about losing farms in Minnesota especially cattle farms uh, and our specialty crops. And you you mentioned those two things because Governor Walls has proposed 10 million dollars in aid half of that would be directed to drought relief grants for those two things that you mentioned livestock producers and specialty crop producers why are these groups specifically in need of support? You know, we really focused on looking at the overall system in ag. All farmers could probably use some support, but you know, corn, soybean, wheat farmers, they do have a good safety net in crop insurance. The cattle farmers, especially croppers, while there is some assistance, it is just not uh, to that level. And so we felt like the state has a, a surplus. We have some dollars that we could help support our industry right now. Because by supporting our industry and keeping our farmers, we're actually going to help the state in the long run. And that helps those corn and soybean farmers if they have cattle to sell to. And so this is why we focused on uh, those, uh, you know, our pastures, our hayland uh, really dried up this year. In fact, still only 3% of Minnesota's pasture is in excellent condition, where 60% of our pasture land in Minnesota is in poor, very poor condition. Uh, the other $5 million in the governor's proposal provides funding for the Rural Finance Authority's Disaster Recovery Loan Program, allowing zero interest loans to cover drought-related expenses or losses. Who benefits from these generally, and why is this proposal a mixture of both grants and zero interest loans? Yeah, and we kind of like that approach because a grant kind of helps. It's kind of a, you know, helps a farmer pay a bill or two, which is important. We did this a couple of years ago for dairy farmers. And, you know, I had farmers come up to me in tears thinking, you know, for that help or that check, help pay that bill, help them get over the hump, help them know that the state cared about our industry. So those grants are important that would help things like wells, uh, water, fencing, things that they've had to do this summer. The loan that goes along with that for maybe more money that a farmer needs. We have a zero interest loan. So think of our rural finance authority as like our bank at the department where the legislature has appropriated dollars. And we have a revolving loan account that uh, has does may not have enough money in it to uh, uh, facilitate all the needs. Even just today, I've taken calls uh, from farmers who are looking to use that and it would help us boost that up so we have enough. And that's a zero interest loan with a nice payback time. So it would help those farmers. Uh, a statement from the Senate's Agriculture Chair, Tori Westrom, who will also be a guest on this program, calls for a mixture of grants and property tax rebates. 
Majority Leader Jeremy Miller expressed support for a bipartisan solution in, in some kind of aid for farmers. So in your view, are property tax rebates another way to help farmers? You know, absolutely. I think that, you know, what we wanted to do by getting this proposal out there is everybody was kind of talking about drought relief, but nobody was putting anything on the table. So we uh, decided let's put this on the table. It's ready to go, um, but we're totally uh, willing to work with. It needs to be bipartisan. We need a program that things and people are gonna use. I've been able to, talk and meet with Senator Westrom. We've worked on our bills, have always passed with bipartisan support. Uh, I was able to connect with uh, um, uh, uh, Majority Leader uh, Miller this morning, you know, and so I think we'll keep working on hopefully a good package that uh, could involve uh, different items, but this is where we wanted to start. Well, in the greater context is the whole political situation in which we find ourselves because there is this aid package. There is the frontline worker pay, which, you know, we hear that they may be getting close to an agreement. Those are the reasons why Governor Walls would call a special session. But there's also this this uh, looming potential threat of the Senate Republican caucus dismissing Commissioner of Health Jan Malcolm. So how do you feel about the politics that seem to be getting involved in this? Yeah, you know, I represent uh, all of Minnesota, but I really represent our farmers. And the clock's ticking for our farmers. You know, the, the amount of farmers that I talked to, I talked to a group of farmers last night who they need help now, you know, and uh, the federal government has help too, but it, sometimes it takes a while. Like some, in some programs, farmers are getting paid now for a disaster in 2019. That uh, we're able to step in and work closer if we're able to get something done. And so that's why I pushed the governor, the governor, and we looked at that, uh, let's come out with something, let's let's try to include something in this as we, as we can because the clock's ticking for a lot of farmers. You know, we lost 20 dairy farmers in July and another 20 in August, and that's hard for me when I open that report in the uh, every month to see how many dairy farmers we have, and I know a lot of those are, are caused by the drought, help push them into that. Uh, broadening out our conversation now, um, water is essentially a part of this conversation because we have a lack of it right now. And the Department of Natural Resources is the agency that handles permits for crop irrigation. This was one summer of drought, but climate change experts are pointing to greater volatility. You mentioned 2019 having excessive rain, you know, so, so we have this, you know, ebb and flow and you never know, obviously in farming, you never know. But how should, in this evolving landscape and water usage, should the agriculture industry be thinking about water? You know, I think that uh, I've toured a lot of irrigation farms this summer because that's been a big issue is that uh, is being smarter about uh, all of our water usage. And really, I, I say smarter and thinking about the climate and being prepared for that. And because it's amazing what our irrigators are doing now, you know, they control everything from their phone and they can uh, really uh, do amazing things with the water usage and to um, really control and, and um, minimize, you know, what they need to use and put on. And so uh, I think it's uh, a lot of good things going on with water, but also how do we protect that soil moisture by maybe using cover crops? We have a great program at the Department of Agriculture, our Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, that uh, the governor has a goal of getting to uh, 2 million acres by 2022. And we're almost to about 800,000 acres enrolled in 1,100 farmers that have changed farming practices for uh, to help with conservation, but a lot of those farmers are seeing benefits in the drought. So I think there's good positive things going on uh, with that. And, and this, the drought and the rains push those conversations. Finally, before we go, uh, the census data has been released and it shows that Minnesota is becoming increasingly diverse. There have been many stories over the past few years about the aging of Minnesota's farmers and I'm wondering if we're turning a corner in the state and what's the situation with both younger farmers and farmers who represent a diverse background? You know, and, and you know, we always think about a lot of people look like me, you know, a 50 year old white male, uh, our average age of a farmer in Minnesota is 58 years old. 
Uh, we have a lot of family owned farms, but we have a lot of opportunities in Minnesota. So we at the department, we started Emerging Farmers Working Group um, over a year ago, um, where we brought together, uh, whether it's Somali, Hmong, veterans, all people that want to get into farming and uh, have been advising the department on uh, that program. And we also, the legislature helped us fund an emerging farmer uh, a person to help us at the agency. Well, we have a great suite of loans, grants, and other things that help our beginning farmers. I'd argue we have the best in the upper Midwest. Uh, so, big issue. Commissioner Tom Peterson, it's such a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. To continue our conversation about agricultural issues in Minnesota, I reached out to Senator Tory Westrom, the chair of the Senate Agriculture and Rural Development Committee, for his perspective on the need for farm relief and whether Minnesota is adequately managing its water resources. This summer's lack of rain has been pretty hard on farmers in many areas of the state. Crop yields will be lower in those areas. Also, the Department of Agriculture reported that the hay supply in Minnesota is at its third lowest level since 1950. What have you been hearing from farmers and producers? Well, Shannon, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about agriculture and the current uh, conditions and the drought that uh, many farmers have experienced this year as the Senate Ag Chair. Uh, we want to uh, make sure we can do everything we can to help uh, reinforce and uh, help support our agriculture community and our farmers that do such a great job of feeding our state and uh, all of the, the country, really. Um, but the drought has been tough. Uh, we've been hearing from a lot of farmers. The livestock farmers probably the most concerned about the forage uh, and the lack thereof. Uh, the, the first crop of hay was looking real well, good, and it came in well. But uh, many farmers in August were telling me uh, most of their uh, second crop was, was next to nothing. Third crop wasn't looking that good. Uh, fortunately, uh, so many prayers were answered with some good rains coming late in August, but in a lot of cases that was too little too late, uh, especially for the crop farmers. But um, livestock and the forage concerns of getting through winter. Uh, many were able to make it through this fall, but I grew up on a farm, a dairy farm myself, and I know how important that forage is to have enough in the shed or in the haylage pile to uh, make it through the winter months. And that's the concern uh, that right. they have to get in from so far away. So to that end, Governor Walls has proposed $10 million in aid to farmers. $5 million would be in rapid response grants, particularly for livestock producers and specialty crop producers. And then $5 million in zero interest loans through the Rural Finance Authority. What are your thoughts on this proposal? Well, uh, we have been talking with the Ag Commissioner and uh, the Governor's Office on this proposal, uh, talking with many farm groups, and uh, we are open to this proposal, open to the idea of giving some one-time uh, uh, rapid assistance to farmers that are affected. And uh, many, many uh, of us are talking about the target and need for targeting it towards the livestock industry mostly. In agriculture. Uh, crop insurance, for example, has a, a, a crop farmers, excuse me, have an opportunity to have crop insurance, which gives them a safety net and uh, pre prevention against some of these uh, unforeseen uh, weather circumstances where livestock farmers and forage, the forage they raise is not able to be covered by crop insurance or uh, specialty farmers. And so uh, we're trying to look at the best ways to get this out. So I think it's a good starting point. Uh, we are looking at maybe property tax rebates as, as well or in addition or instead. Right. Uh, in and, the I, and I just so, want to ask you about that. What, what's the idea behind the property tax rebate? And then for those farmers that rent land, because land is very expensive, would they not be eligible for that? Well, we would, we would want to help the farmer because they're the ones actively engaged in this uh, business. Uh, they have the risk. They have the fixed expenses. Uh, to, to cover in their operation. Uh, if they're renting some of their uh, pasture land or, or land, uh, they are paying it 
through rent because rents reflect all the costs for the landowner. So we are working through some of those details, but uh, we have a history 20 years ago uh, with under Governor Ventura, we did a property tax rebate for farmers. It would be a quicker way to get some of the dollars out and maybe just a, a fixed percentage off of property taxes up to say $5,000 or some fixed amount, maybe uh, eight or $10 an acre uh, on the first uh, three or 500 acres. Uh, those are just some ideas that we're talking about, trying to work through uh, these ideas and uh, we could get them out quicker. The property taxes are a fixed cost that all farmers, uh, livestock farmers as well would have in their operation. And uh, if we could get them a, a one-time supplement drought aid check for that, it could help cover some of these costs of property taxes or the higher cost of bringing in forage, hay from out of state. Um, I, was, I was at a meeting this morning in Alexandria at an ag business uh, meeting uh, at Alec Tech. They put on every year. Uh, they were talking about uh, many farmers having to look at Southern Iowa, Missouri, and uh, that far out for bringing in forage. And that's that's quite expensive, $100 a ton or, or, or more. So it certainly seems like the governor and lawmakers are interested in an aid package for farmers. Uh, if there is a special session, are you hopeful? I, I am. I think uh, there's, there's an opportunity to help uh, those farmers that have been hit the hardest by the drought and uh, those counties in our state, especially those with livestock and that don't have other insurance options to uh, cover that, that risk that they've been hit with. Um, uh, again, we are, we are very thankful. Uh, the prayers have been answered with the rains that we've recently had, but uh, we have a lot of, lot of moisture to replenish in the soil. Um, ironically, uh, another positive side of this, uh, the breakfast I was, ag breakfast I was at this morning, uh, uh, some of the farm business manager, managers that were presenting were uh, pleasantly surprised with some of the yields that beans and uh, corn have been bringing in in certain areas. So this is very uh, spotty throughout the state and uh, soil conditions is a, is a big part of it. Uh, again, it looked like uh, the forage is, is probably one of the biggest concerns that we need to deal with for our livestock producers. So they can get through the winter and not have to sell off their livestock uh, herds uh, which they spend many years trying to build up those genetics and those herds so they can sustain and have a, uh, a herd big enough to support their family and maybe their their uh, sons and daughters who want to farm with them. I'd like to zoom out just a little bit to a broader question about water in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota Public Radio reported this summer that the drought had caused some wells to dry up. Certainly rivers, streams, and lakes are lower, but I wonder what your assessment is of how Minnesota is doing in managing aquifers and other water resources, particularly in light of the shortage of water that we had over this summer? Well, it's always uh, a concern uh, that we have uh, adequate water resources. Uh, the aquifers are a great a natural resource that our farmers can tap. Um, sometimes I think we uh, try to legislate or, or regulate from the extremes and uh, using the drought conditions of this year uh, aren't probably a good ba uh, base to uh, work off of. Just like two years ago, uh, when we had so much water, uh, we had a local river uh, in my home county that uh, was just running, running wild. They couldn't even get a road project finished because they couldn't slow the, the water down enough that where this year the river was just about dry. And so uh, nature is fickle. It does uh, ebb and flow. And so we don't want to react or overreact, uh, uh, but it has shown us how important our aquifers are. Uh, in some cases, uh, many farmers are, are having are struggling working and getting through the permit process that's gotten uh, quite burdensome. So uh, that's the other concern that I have is that uh, many farmers could have weathered this storm or this drought, if you will, uh, a little better if we would have been able to make it possible for them to have irrigation on their farm. And in the areas where there's concern about the aquifers going down too far or going dry, uh, there has been prorated use in those areas. And, and I think we've got a pretty good balance of, of uh, making sure that there's um, limited use when the aquifers are going down. In many cases, they put test wells in uh, alongside the, the irrigation well. 
Uh, but you know, Mother Nature recharges those very fast in most cases. And so uh, I think it's uh, put an exclamation point on how important irrigation is to our farmers and the specialty crops that many of them raise uh, because of irrigation. So we want to have a, a good environment, uh, regulatory environment to allow irrigation and uh, but also watch out that those aquifers uh, can stay healthy and uh, you know more rain recharges them quickly. Senator Tory Westrom, thank you so much. Thank you. At a press conference last week, a group of Senate and House DFL lawmakers announced the creation of a Reproductive Freedom Caucus. The work of supporting Minnesotans' decisions to choose if and when to start a family, to receive accurate medical information in both educational settings and during the healthcare process, and to access affordable reproductive care free from harassment and fear has been ongoing work in our communities across the state of Minnesota for decades. It's time that the legislature makes it a priority at the Capitol to support the work that's already being done in our communities. I see every day how critical sexual and reproductive health care is to the lives of Minnesotans. Access to contraception so people can plan and space pregnancies or control underlying health conditions, medically accurate sex education so people have the information they need to make informed decisions and consensual choices, bias-free pregnancy care and abortion care that is accessible, affordable, and free of medically unnecessary barriers. Minnesotans should be free to make their own decisions about their bodies and their families without interference from the government or anti-abortion politicians. This is not your grandmother's uh, choice caucus. This is a reproductive freedom caucus. Uh, this is above and beyond that. This is a caucus that uh, will be intersectional in our scope and will be focused on the rights of all Minnesotans to access access to care and access to rights uh, that they all should have. Uh, again, this ability to control our bodies and what happens to our bodies is perhaps the most fundamental right that we have as human beings. And that is what we're here today uh, to push forward and champion. BIPOC communities, especially black and indigenous communities, have faced some of the worst and most egregious reproductive oppression um, from forced systemic coerced sterilization to lack of access to reliable birth control to uh, lack of access to emergency contraception and anti-immigration bias. Institutionalized racism coupled with a history of reproductive oppression has resulted in many African American individuals having health care and high having health care issues and higher rates of reproductive health issues. We know that people with lower incomes are especially likely to lack control over their reproductive choices. And in Minnesota, 28.6% of African Americans live at or below the poverty line. There's a place for every Minnesotan in the movement that we're talking about. It crosses issues. It crosses different pieces of legislation. We're talking about comprehensive reproductive freedom. So we thought it is past time in the Minnesota legislature that we get together and form a formal caucus to fight for reproductive justice, to fight for reproductive freedom on behalf of every Minnesotan. It's long overdue and we are ready to take that fight to the legislature and protect Minnesotans' right to reproductive freedom and expand those rights and strengthen and fortify those rights. For more than 20 years, Roy Wilkins was the executive secretary of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Spiral for Justice Memorial on the Minnesota Capitol grounds commemorates his work for racial equality. I spoke with recently retired CAP Board Secretary Paul Mandel about the memorial and its recent renovation. Roy Wilkins is credited with helping to achieve some of the greatest civil rights advancements in U.S. history. What else is important to know about him? Well, he was local. He was a local um, hero, basically, back in those days. Worked through the law system, which is why this whole, the, the spiral ends up pointing towards the, the, the judicial building. 
Um, unlike Martin Luther King, who worked outside the system, um, Wilkins worked through the system and was working through the legal processes. Um, so that's the main distinction point. Um, he did go on to national repute, and of course he's got the, the Wilkins Center here in, in St. Paul and such. Between the plaque and the doors that we are interactive, it tells more about his history and what impacts and some of the quotes that he had. What do the quotes tell us? The quotes are sort of give you an, um, an insight into both the times that he was working with and his thoughts, because um, everyone knows Martin Luther King and not everyone knows of Roy Wilkins. So if you start from this end, you get a bas relief of his face and some of biographical, and then various quotes that sort of either depict the time or his work or his thoughts. Um, sort of his version of the I have a dream type thing. What is the significance of the spiral shape and of the actual shape of the sort of pyramid type things? I'm not quite sure if he was uh, modeled somewhat after the, like the Washington Monument, but it's, a, it's purposely ascending as he started his work and became more and more prominent and became more and more involved. It starts off you know, from his years of leadership, basically markers in time that where he was struggling and not getting anywhere. And then as, as, the, um, as the pieces rise, he's getting more and more influence and getting more and more known and having more and more success to the point when in the final end, it all points to the judicial center with the reliquy at the end, of, at the end point. What, what about the, the flooring around the spirals? What is that supposed to represent? It's all representative of African um, either symbols or patterns, sort of like the, the, the Hmong flooring is very, very uh, representative of their, of their uh, designs. But it's, it's repetitive and it's purposely chained off because in the winter it gets very slippery with the ice and uh, bronze also heats up so it gets a lot of sun and a lot of heating, which is why we have wood benches um, they're actually wood coverings because the bronze benches, when we first had them, some people got actually hurt by sitting on them in the middle of the summer. Oh, ouch. So we put some teak wood on top of them. The memorial recently underwent a renovation. What had happened to it over time and what needed to be done to restore it? This is all bronze and the first patination job had been done under extreme weather conditions and it really didn't take well and then it had been vandalized over time. The doors had all been broken either accidentally or intentionally so some of them were broke were uh, always open some of them wouldn't open or some of them were dangerous when they open and shut so because they're on fulcrums it needed complete stripping down and repatination so we chose the color based on the original intent which was sort of a warm light bronze and so they repatent stripped it all down repatinated it, and then waxed it all so it would stay like this um, so it won't change color over time. So it won't change color over time. It won't become the green that we see copper happening. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.